Okay, and welcome to this rehearsal of uh, The Nature of Phenomenal Consciousness. I'm getting ready to p present this at the Graduate Center um, at their uh, Philosophy Colloquium, September 5th, 2012. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a great honor for me to be presenting this talk at the Graduate Center, um, especially in light of the fact that the date is pretty much four years to the day since I defended my dissertation, September 3rd, 2008. It was a Wednesday. Uh, it was a dark and stormy day. No, just kidding. But it was a Wednesday, and so it's a great honor to be coming back on this Wednesday colloquium and um, uh, giving this talk. Now, of course, having studied at the Graduate Center, um, I'm uh, deeply influenced by David Rosenthal and the higher order theory. And so you could call this uh, talk a Confessions of a Higher Order Heretic because I'm going to be presenting an argument for what might be considered to be a, a non-standard version of the higher order theory. So I like to think about it in a way that's different from the way that uh, David Rosenthal thinks about it. And so we'll go ahead and see what we think about this. Okay, so I do want to be talking about phenomenal consciousness. And before we start, uh, we should say I want to set up the dialectic of the talk. So I want to begin by talking about two concepts of phenomenal consciousness. Now, right off the bat, uh, <clears throat> phenomenal consciousness, people ask, well, what, it, what are you talking about? What does that mean? I think it's a very simple and intuitive idea, and it's one that um, this uh, phrase, what it's like for one, originating with Thomas Nagel, of course, uh, has now become um, part of the vernacular, so that when we talk about phenomenal consciousness, what we mean are those states which there's something that it's like for you to be in. And we can contrast this um, with uh, what's going on inside a computer or a video camera when it's pointed at a certain visual stimulus and what's going on inside of you. So uh, there's no theoretical baggage, it's sort of just an epistemic notion. But even at this point, what we see is two very different ways of cashing out what this means. And this is where we get into the theoretical aspects of our concept here. So on the one hand, we have people like Ned Block who think that phenomenal consciousness, um, by which they mean those things which it's like something for you to have, that those states are going to, or properties, are going to be properties of first order states. And by first order state, we mean ones that represent the world. So the kinds of things you would find in the sensory cortices, in the visual cortex, in the auditory cortex, um, or what have you. So, and the crucial idea that's going to come into play here is that these kinds of states um, are ones that you could have even if you weren't accessing them in any way. So they're somehow, in some sense of the word, um, not dependent on your access to those states. Now on the other hand, so that's what we'll call the first order view of phenomenal consciousness. Now on the other hand, we have what we can call the higher order view of phenomenal consciousness. And on the higher order approach, phenomenal consciousness really just is mental appearances. It's the way your mental life appears to you. So you have the first order states, that's your mental life. You have your thoughts, your sensations, and etc. And then you have the appearance that those states present, which would be the way you're aware of them. So, so then the way that I have the talk set up is that we have these two concepts of phenomenal consciousness. We want to know which one is better supported by the evidence. And so I want to go through and look at a bunch of different kinds of evidence for and against each one of these conceptions. And I'm going to argue ultimately that the higher order conception turns out to be better supported by the evidence. So that's what we've been talking about, setting up the outline here, talking about these two concepts of phenomenal consciousness, and I want to present the arguments for and against it. So one the, uh, argument there's been a lot of activity on, that's the phenomenological overflow front. And of course, Ned was just here at the colloquium last semester giving the most recent on this. They had an ASSC. Um, symposium on it. There's been a lot of articles in Trends in Cognitive Science. Um, my own paper, The Myth of Phenomenological Overflow, came out in Consciousness and Cognition. So this is something that's currently going on and it's often interpreted, uh, even though Ned doesn't present it this way, but it's often interpreted uh, 
as an argument against the higher order kinds of theories because they rely on cognitive access. Um, and so we want to look at that and basically what I'll suggest is that there's no good empirical evidence for it and also some real serious philosophical problems with the idea of overflow. So then I want to move on to another problem that Bloch has brought attention to recently and that's what I call the new problem of misrepresentation um, for higher order theories. And again this is supposed to show according to Ned that the higher order theory is just defunct. This is his analysis paper. Um, of course there's been a bunch of responses from Josh Weisberg and David Rosenthal and um, I won't reiterate their responses but I'll give what I think the correct interpretation of the argument and what its lessons are and I'll argue really it just shows us something important about the higher order theory but doesn't present a challenge to it. So having done that I want to pause for a second and point out what I think is a surprising consequence of the, um, the, the, the higher order conception of phenomenal consciousness which isn't much talked about and this is a paper that I'm still working on and I've enlisted uh, Pete Mendick, uh, we're co-writing a paper on this or we're going to be co-writing a paper on this and I'm very excited about that but I'll present um, what the core argument here which is, uh, which is this surprising result that once you adopt the higher order conception of consciousness it follows that thoughts must be phenomenally conscious and so if you like that that's a welcome thing if you don't like uh, cognitive phenomenology then this might be a bit of a problem okay so um, that's already quite a bit but you know I was always told in graduate school that I tried to do too much in my papers and talks and it was funny to me because I thought uh, well I, I wasn't really trying to do too much so I figured uh, for this talk I would actually give it the old college try and so I'm going to try to pack a lot into this talk and so not only do I want to talk about those um, uh, arguments for and against higher order views but I want to look at some of the more convincing <clears throat> empirical arguments for the higher order view. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I want to talk about the argument which I think is very powerful, the one that Rosenthal has advanced in many places, the argument from concepts. And then I'm going to talk uh, something I know a little bit about. That's the results coming out of Hakuan Lau's lab. And of course, Hakuan and I co-wrote a paper which is going to be is due to come out in this um, fest drift for Ned Block. So this um, an opportunity to present what I think is really some of the best evidence for thinking the higher order thought theory is true. And then at the end, again in the spirit of trying to do too much, I want to come back and look at some of the more a priori arguments. Um, traditionally, we found a priori arguments against physicalism. I want to present an a priori argument against non-materialism. And then I want to diagnose the problem I find with the kinds of uh, arguments you get from Kripke. So that's a lot and we've got a, um, an hour to do it. So let's go ahead and turn to the specifics. Now like I said I want to start by talking about phenomenological overflow. And even though this is not explicitly part of the argumentative um, structure that Bloch has in mind, it definitely isn't posing a threat to higher order views because it's supposed to be an argument for that first order conception of phenomenal consciousness. It's supposed to show that there is phenomenal consciousness in the absence of cognitive access. So let's go ahead and look at the evidence. Now I assume this is well known. This is a figure um, from a recent set of experiments. Um, uh, this one's come from a, a Landman and Schlichte et al. And so uh, there's three conditions here. And so first of all, let's just look at the experimental setup. You have subjects. They're looking at a gray screen, um, what you see in the middle there. And they're presented um, with these grading patches, rectangular shapes arranged in a clock-like formation. And so you can see what's going on there. Now, of course, what's missing from the stimulus that is presented to us here is the actual grading patches so that these things are designed in such a way that when you fixate on them and then you remove the stimulus you get you see the after image there um, and so they're depending on that so in the first condition you show them this clock face arrangement you have them fixate half a second 500 milliseconds then you have the gray screen they can vary the inner stimulus interval between 200 to 1500 milliseconds, so um, a fraction of a second to 
a second and a half. So that's a pretty long period of time. And they've done uh, follow-ups to this where they've extended that uh, inner stimulus interval. And we can talk about that. So um, you flash the inner the gray screen, and then you reshow the clockwork formation. You point to one particular rectangle, and you ask subjects, did that rectangle change its orientation or not? And it turns out subjects are very bad at doing this, um, at keeping track of that. Okay. So now, in the second condition, um, they do the same thing, except they use the cube before they show the inner stimulus interval. So um, you point to the rectangle, and we assume that they're having the after image in the intermediate period, so they're sort of keeping track of which one you pointed to. And you show them, you ask them, did it change? Subjects are very good at doing that. Okay, so now the interesting result comes in the third condition, which is listed with a, a C here in the figure. And here, what you do is you put the Q in the inner stimulus interval. So you flash the things, they fixate, you remove it. Presumably, they're having this conscious after images. Uh, subjects report that they can see all of the rectangles even after the stimulus is removed. So they're, for a brief period of time, still having the stimulus there. You point, if they're having the conscious experience, then they can sort of just read off from their phenomenology what the orientation is. <clears throat> then you ask them, did this one change? Subjects are very good at telling you the change. So now what we're supposed to think about here is what's going on in the cases, say in case A, where you're very bad at detecting whether the thing has changed or not. Now we know that um, uh, subjects say they see the after image, so they're having all of that um, uh, conscious experience, presumably. They're very bad at actually telling you. So it seems as though, and this is what Bloch says, quote, so, subject has persisting experiences as of more specific shapes than can be brought under the concepts required to report or compare those specific shapes with others. They can all be brought under the concept rectangle, but not the specific orientation concepts which would be required to make the comparison. So Bloch's idea here is that you may have some con concepts which are being applied here like rectangle and so you might conceptually be aware there's a bunch of rectangles around but that there's more than that. There's the actual detailed experiences of the shapes and their orientations and the reason for thinking this is that well if you cue them to it they can report it so the information is there but yet they get many of these wrong and so they aren't able to report everything that they can consciously experience. So that's in some rough form the overflow argument which I think is by now is familiar. The problem with it is that there's a very good response the higher order theory has right off the bat. So here I am an average subject and I'm looking at this thing. I fixate on it they um, produces in me a conscious visual experience. According to the higher order theory, what that means is, well, I have a higher order thought, um, and that higher order thought can be very specific. It can, can represent uh, that first order state. Let's assume that that's a, a collection of states are somehow bundled into a unified first order um, state. And there's reason to uh, think this and block points of these kinds of empirical evidence that suggests that the thing is actually bound together, um, whether conscious or not. So you have the conscious experience that it could be very detailed, like that the um, you're seeing all the shapes and it could encode the orientations of each of the shape and you could have a very detailed conscious experience. Uh, of course, you could also have a less detailed conscious experience. So if you're aware of that first order experience, not in all of its detail, but in respect of some of its detail, like that there are rectangles there, then you'll have a conscious experience, but without all of the details there. But of course, you can report that you see all of the rectangles, and in fact, you do. So this is the important point of the higher order response. You have a conscious experience, and so you, you consciously see all the rectangles. But the claim is you might not see them 
with respect to all of their details. So you consciously see them, but you leave out some of the detail, like their orientations. And so the idea is that the conscious experience of the person um, may not encode actually all of the details, even if the unconscious representation representation does encode all of the details. And so the idea is that subjects conscious experience exactly what they report. Now Bloch has recently responded to this, and this is um, in his uh, Trends in Cognitive Science uh, paper. He's, he says, look, we don't have any kind of evidence that there are these detailed unconscious representations. And of course, that's an interesting empirical question. Uh, maybe we don't have the evidence yet, but this would be worth knowing if, if not only because it points towards future empirical work. But on the other hand, one might think, well, look, there is some evidence for these unconscious representations. Um, and in fact, the kind of Schlichte experiments we just looked at provide evidence for these unconscious representations. Um, uh, it, they're only evidence against this if one is assuming that those representations um, have to be conscious with respect to all of their details. And there are interesting other um, uh, uh, studies which could be brought to bear on this. But Bloch has also, not only has he argued that um, we don't have any evidence that these exist, but he thinks that there's evidence against it. So he appeals to the recent work of, of Soto et al., um, which suggests that these kinds of unconscious representations are fragile, uh, they, they form and then dissipate, and so uh, they don't provide the kind of steady representation which would be needed uh, to explain the kinds of results that we get from the kinds of uh, paradigms that we're looking at here. Now, of course, the real problem with the Soto experiments, and we don't need to go into the details of the experiment because there's just a, a glaring problem, which Bloch himself acknowledges, and that's that these experiments are using masking. And we'll talk about masking later in this talk, but the basic idea that you just need to know now is that when you mask a stimulus, it makes the stimulus invisible to the subject so that they'll deny seeing anything. And of course, if what you're doing is saying, okay, well, can you use an invisible stimuli to produce these robust unconscious um, representations? The, the answer is, well, maybe you can't. And so the SOTO doesn't really bear on the kinds of work we're talking about here, where subjects are looking at the thing for 500 milliseconds. Um, and so uh, it's not that they're going to have an unconscious representation in, like you get in the SOTO. Rather, what they're going to have is a representation that's conscious in some respects, but not others, uh, possibly just due to the normal course of events, um, which is taking place in these experimental situations, like that the after image is, is basically fading. So this is a real confound, and Bloch acknowledges this, he recognizes that this is a confound, but it, that's kind of Bloch's strategy, is to look holistically at the evidence so that any one bit of evidence in isolation may not be decisive, but what he thinks is you gather them all together and you get something which is um, a compelling case. So he says, in addition, uh, Schlichte et al. in a different paper provided evidence for persisting representations in V4, but not in the early visual areas V1, V2, or V3, where one would expect them if they were unconscious. So when you do the imaging studies, and so subjects are in there, they're, they're saying they have these um, uh, conscious experiences, and you look for areas where the representations are, are sort of matching their um, reports, and you find that in V4, not in the early areas. So he says, well, you know, the early areas would be where unconscious contents are, V4 is where the conscious ones are, that's where you find the activity, and so this is another piece of evidence. But of course, the glaring problem with this argument is that he's just assuming his notion of consciousness, the first order notion. Because on the higher order view, you wouldn't expect V4 to be where the conscious representations are you would expect it to be in the higher order areas, as we'll see later, somewhere possibly like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or at least some parietal areas, nothing in those 
um, early central se sensory area. So this isn't really an argument that you find those representations there because you would expect to find them there on the higher order view as well. And they would be conscious if they're targeted in the right way on many of these kinds of views. So um, this is not a compelling argument. So the conclusion is actually when you look at the details of the empirical stuff, there is no argument for overflow. There's only an argument, I mean, so Bloch's argument is that uh, if you identify consciousness in the first order way, then you can explain overflow. But actually what we found is that there's nothing, there's no overflow. Nowhere have we found more conscious experience than what the subjects can report. So uh, you don't need to explain why there's overflow if there's no overflow. Now, in addition to this, I think you can build a philosophical case against the idea of overflow. So let's start off um, talking about inaccessible consciousness. So what does it mean to say that there's some phenomenal consciousness that uh, is inaccessible? Well, phenomenal consciousness, as we've seen, is that the idea that there's something that it's like for you. When you have a phenomenally conscious experience, it's not merely the case that there's a seeing of green, say. Rather, what happens is you experience the green as somehow your experience. It's for you in a unique and special way. So how can there be inaccessible consciousness? Because the for me part seems to imply access. How can it be for you if it's not accessible? Now, Bloch has responded to this, um, and because this kind of point was made by many people, by, by Dennett, by Cudier, um, uh, by Rosenthal in some um, uh, conversations. So Bloch has responded by saying, look, you guys are misinterpreting me. I'm not saying that it's inaccessible. I'm saying that it's not accessed. So it can be accessed at the next moment, but right at this given moment, it's not accessed. And so the way he puts his view is that he's not arguing for inaccessible consciousness, but he's arguing that necessarily at any given moment, there is unaccessed consciousness. But it doesn't seem to me that this solves any of the problems. So first thing that we might notice is that um, unaccessed consciousness is a thin edge of a wedge. It's a short step as Bloch himself has acknowledged. It's a short step from there to the claim that there's inaccessible consciousness. Because if you can have it when it's not being accessed, then you just imagine a case where it's not being accessed and, oh, by the way, it's impossible for it to be accessed. And you're going to be hard-pressed to sort of argue that it's not phenomenally conscious in that case. But if that's true, then worrying about inaccessible consciousness can serve as a reductio for unaccessed consciousness. So it's a bit of an illegitimate move for Bloch to say ah, you can't talk about inaccessible consciousness, you're making a philosophical mistake because I only argue for the more modest claim. But of course, if the more modest claim leads to the immodest claim, then showing that there's a problem with the immodest claim can give us a reason for rejecting the thing that leads to it. Okay, so this is not a good move. Besides which, if we just think about any given moment and freeze it in time, so to speak, then there is inaccessible consciousness on Bloch's view. It's inaccessible at that moment. And once you realize that, you realize he hasn't solved any problem. Because if it's inaccessible in any sense, then we need to explain how it could be for me, because for me involves awareness. And we can't, it sounds like what he's saying is, ah, you know, there's consciousness with no awareness whatsoever. And that's contradictory. The very concept of phenomenal consciousness, when we analyze it, involves being aware. Now, of course, Bloch is, pun intended, aware of this. And so he's made a big deal out of the fact that he means, oh, look, I'm just saying there's no cognitive access. So there can be awareness. There can be access. It's just not cognitive 
Now, what cognitive means, of course, is another tricky question, but it looks like what he means is that it's not encoded in working memory, it's not made available um, to the prefrontal areas. So you can have another kind of awareness, but it can't be the kind of awareness which is posited by higher order theories, right? That's because it's supposed to be the kind of thing which makes problems for higher order theories. Okay, well, that's a very interesting claim. But what other kind of awareness is there? Now, you might think, well, okay, there's percept higher order perception. Maybe what this is is an argument against higher order thought theories and an argument for higher order perception theories. Now, I don't know if that's true, and I'm not here to make that argument, um, and that's because there are well-known problems with higher order perception theories, and I, I won't rehash these, but it has to do with there being no sensory qualities of a higher order variety. We just don't, it would be, seem weird to posit a whole other set of uh, perception type properties at the higher order level. Now, of course, Bloch doesn't appeal to that, so what, what he said is that he's interested in um, a deflationary view of awareness. Deflationary in the sense that um, appealing to Ernest Sosa, he says, look, when you smile your own smiles, there's nothing extra there. You just do the smiling, and that counts as you smiling your own smile. So maybe the kind of awareness that we're interested in simply is the kind of thing that happens when the state occurs. You being in the state is you being aware of being in the state. And this might be a kind of self-representational view. You have the state, and in virtue of it being there, it's representing itself in the right kind of way. Now, this is very interesting. Um, no one has really fleshed this notion out. Uh, and it seems like there's a real problem with this, which is, what are you going to say which could account for one and the same state being phenomenally conscious at one point and not being phenomenally conscious at another point? So to give this kind of an empirical um, uh, flavor, consider some activity which isn't, which is representing something in the world, say it's in, the, in V2 or V3, but it hasn't fired strong enough or reached the right area, the feedback loop isn't completed, whatever it is that makes it conscious phenomenally hasn't happened on Bloch's view. So forget about the, so something V4 or something like that, okay? So what's happening when it becomes conscious that wasn't happening when it was unconscious? On this deflationary self-representational view, it's all the same stuff is happening. It's representing itself in a deflationary way. It's self-representing itself in a, in a deflationary way. So it doesn't look like that kind of awareness can account for the awareness evolved in phenomenal consciousness. So what's the upshot of all of this then? Well, we don't have an, any kind of reason to believe that there's overflow. We saw no evidence for overflow. We know that phenomenal consciousness requires awareness. The deflationary kind doesn't seem to be the right kind. Higher order kind does seem to be the right kind. So when we considerations of overflow actually come out supporting the higher order conception of consciousness. And I think that's an interesting result because overflow was brought, the whole issue of overflow and these experiments were uh, brought out as a way to try to show that we should abandon the cognitive models of access. But actually careful inspection reveals, no, far, being, uh, far be it that be the conclusion, rather the opposite is, we should abandon the first order one. So, okay, so now we have some evidence for the higher order view. Now we can turn to the next problem, which is the new problem of misrepresentation. Now this is supposed to show us that, look, you know, we can't turn to the higher order view. The very notion of it's defunct in some kind of way. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, Bloch characterizes uh, um, what he calls the aboriginal version of the theory as there being some kind of relationship between the first order state and the higher order state. So you have this representation of yellow. This is just, you know, in V2 or whatever, V4 if you like, it's unconscious. You have a higher order thought 
which targets it, somehow it lights it up and the thing now becomes phenomenally conscious. Right? So that's what Bloch calls the aboriginal version of the higher order view. And if that's your view, then you really have this issue. What happens when you have the higher order state but not the lower order state? So it looks like the theory sort of implodes on itself because you have a sufficient condition which is met, the higher order thought, but you have a necessary condition which is not met because there's no target. There's nothing there. So Bloch concludes, ah, well, you see, the theory just can't give an answer. It sort of says it is conscious, it isn't conscious. There's nothing we can do here. Now, I think that this aboriginal version of theory is actually a misunderstanding. It's a popular misunderstanding, but it's an interpretation of the transitivity principle, which is wrong. So what I claim is that the right way of thinking about the transitivity principle is not that the higher order thought targets some first order state and lights it up, but rather that the higher order thought is phenomenal consciousness. It's the higher order thought itself, which is phenomenally conscious. So that even in the good case, you have the unconscious representation of yellow, the first order state, and then you have the higher order thought about that state, and that's the phenomenally conscious state. So there's no problem um, uh, from misrepresentation on this view. And I have in other places called this the horror theory of phenomenal consciousness. Horror standing for higher order representation of a representation. And the reason I call it the horror theory is to emphasize that the higher order theory is a representational theory of phenomenal consciousness. It doesn't involve a relation between a first order and a higher order state. It involves having the right kind of representation, namely a representation of oneself as being in some first order state. So what you have then are these two versions of the higher order theory, the aboriginal one and then the, the one that was really intended by the author, or at least so I think. And thus, the problem of misrepresentation really shows us that it's that other way of thinking about the theory which is defunct. This way of thinking about the theory is not defunct at all. Now, whether um, uh, this works or not, Bloch seems to be aware of it, and he has the following thing to say. He says, quote, There is, however, a way out to say that what it's likeness is a property of the hot itself, that is, the hot, in a case of an empty hot, is the very state that is conscious and has what is likeness. However, it is not clear how this view can preserve the insight that a conscious state is a state one is conscious of. Perhaps the hot is always self-reflexive, a state of consciousness of itself, but as noted earlier, this would be a version of the rival same order theory. I think that this objection actually embodies a mistake. So we've got to keep the various notions of consciousness separate. So on the one hand, we have the idea of transitive consciousness. So suppose that you have this mental state, it's a representation of yellow. Well, it makes you conscious of some property in the environment. So there's some consciousness involved, but it's not phenomenally conscious. It's an unconscious representation. Now suppose you have a higher order thought about it. Now we can say that there is this targeting relationship captured by the arrow on this slide. And if we wanted to say which state is it that you're transitively conscious of, we would say the first order state. And there's a word that we use for that. That's called state consciousness, coined by um, various people in the literature. And it's, you know, Bloch sometimes talks about the modest version of the higher order theory. And so in that sense, we can say that the target of the hot is a conscious state. It's conscious in that modest sense of state conscious. But when we talk about phenomenal consciousness, we're not talking about that modest sense. We're talking about something more ambitious. We're talking about the state in virtue of which there is something that it's like for you to have this experience. 
that's the higher order thought itself. And it's not because it represents itself. It represents the first order state. And more in particular, it represents that you are in fact in that state. So this preserves the transitivity principle in the horrifying way. So the transitivity principle says a conscious mental state is one I am conscious of myself as being in. Phenomenal consciousness is having that property, having the property of being conscious of myself as being in a first order state. So we don't give it up. We haven't collapsed back into the first order self-representational view. It's still a version of the higher order theory. Okay, so that's what I think the problem of misrepresentation shows. Now you might wonder, look, aren't there any alternatives? Isn't there something else we can say in response to this challenge? So you might say, as people like Rocco Gennaro do, that when you have the first order state all by itself, there's no phenomenal consciousness. And when you have the higher order state all by itself, there's no phenomenal consciousness. But when you have the two states together, and the right representation relation between them, then the first order state is, becomes phenomenally conscious. The higher order part is still unconscious. So that's roughly Rocco Gennaro's view. Now there's a, a serious problem with this, which is, okay, what happens when you just have the higher order state? Now Gennaro says there's no consciousness there, but it just seems impossible to explain within the confines of the theory itself why it should be the case that there's no conscious experience in this case. You have the appearances, the appearance of being in the first order state, so unless you adopt something like the horror view, uh, um, you just haven't got an explanation for why there's consciousness in the other case. At least not in terms of higher order awareness. Now you might say, okay, well, um, what about the, the version that Hakuan Lao has developed, which is roughly the same. Um, uh, you have the first order state, there's nothing that it's like for the subject, but then you have this higher order state which targets it, and that lights up the first order state. So that Hakuan's view is that you have the two parts to what could be considered a complex thought. You have the I think I see part, and then you have the thing you think you see. So if you think you see yellow, the first order state provides the yellowness. The higher order state provides the feeling of seeing and the determinateness of the uh, very vivid, not very vivid, et cetera, et cetera. Now this gets it right uh, on the question we just asked because Hakuan does admit that, look, if you just have the first higher order state, you're going to have a feeling that you see something, but then when someone asks you, you might not be able to say it. And so he thinks, well, that's how we can explain what's going on in the Landman Schlichter cases. You have the feeling of seeing them all, but you don't have the contents there. Now, the problem with this view, though, philosophically, is you get the reverse of the Rocco Gennaro problem, because the question is, well, why isn't it the case that there's something that it's like for you to have the first order state when you're not aware of it? How is it that merely targeting it, touching it with the representation, getting its address, whatever it is, um, how does that transform the state into a conscious one? And more specifically, how does the content, the specific shade of yellow that this state represents, get into the experience? Why is it like seeing that shade for you as opposed to some other one? Now, unless you have the content in the higher order state and you can explain it in terms of mental appearances, it seems like you just have the first order view. So Hakuan's view doesn't seems to collapse. Either you go all the way in the higher order content, it's just a horror view, or it goes into the first order content, it's just a first order view. So it seems then that the lesson that we should derive from this new problem of misrepresentation is not that it shows that the higher order theory is false, or the horror theory survives it just fine. You might have liked the aboriginal version. That version's false, if you like. Horror theory is not false. But rather, what this shows us is that we've got to take horror theory as a viable alternative. That phenomenal consciousness just is the higher order representation. Okay, so...
Once we've got clear about that, now we're ready to see the surprising consequence, which is that if you adopt the horror theory, if you take this view of phenomenal consciousness, then it's got to be the case that conscious thoughts have a phenomenology as well. And the argument's very, very simple. It can be made very, very quickly. But before I do that, let me just say what I mean by cognitive phenomenology. So this is a paper taken from David Pitt. Uh, excuse me, a quote taken from a paper of David Pitt uh, entitled, What is it like to think that P? So here's how he defines cognitive phenomenology. Each type of conscious thought, each state of consciously thinking that P, for all thinkable contents P, has a proprietary, distinctive, individuative phenomenology, end quote. So just quickly then, proprietary means that the phenomenology of thought is not merely sensory phenomenology. It's something which is only had by thoughts. It's distinctive, which means that separate thoughts will have distinct phenomenologies. What is it like to think that P will differ from what is it like to think that P prime? And to say that it's individuative is to say that the phenomenology that a thought has individuates the thought itself. So that's the thesis of cognitive phenomenology. And I think that the higher order view as the one that escapes mismatch problems and overflow problems is committed to this claim. Why? Well, again, as I've said, the argument is very simple. So it goes like this. When I have a higher order thought to the effect that I think that P, it should appear to me as though I think that P, because that's what mental appearances are. They're just the right kinds of higher order thoughts. But now, phenomenology is a matter of mental appearances. So when I have the higher order thought, it appears to me as though I think that P, therefore, there must be phenomenology, because phenomenology is mental appearances. And notice that it meets the three, the three criterion. So it's proprietary because I'm having a thought that I think something and that's going to be what it's like for me. It's going to appear to me as though I'm thinking something, not as though I'm seeing something. So it's going to be proprietary. It's going to be distinct because the appearances are determined by the content of the thought. So if I appear to be thinking P as opposed to P prime, it's got different appearances, different phenomenologies. And of course, it's individuative because a thought having the phenomenology that it does is just a certain higher order thought having the content that it does. So it seems to me the theory is just locked into the claim. There's no way to deny it without denying the idea that phenomenology is mental appearances. And so if you do deny it, it seems as though you lose all of the explanatory oomph and power that the higher order theory has been developing. Now, of course, at that point, you might just say, good, okay, fine, then I'm out, right? Because this is just getting weirder and weirder, and I just don't believe in the theory. So even if there's no evidence for the first order view at this point, we should look into formulating it. Now, of course, I think that's the wrong thing to conclude from all this, and I think that's the wrong thing to conclude because there's good evidence supporting the higher order view. So let's just look at that. Now, I think the more famous line is the side of wine tasting, dental fear type cases that Rosenthal's talked about in many different places. So wine tasting, you sip the wine, you experience it. Someone says, what about the oakiness of it? You go oakiness and you, hmm, ah, your experience is different because you learned a word. So if that's what's going on, you learn a word, you have a different experience, it seems like the only plausible explanation of that is that you have a new concept to figure in a higher order content. And so the mental appearances change because of the new concept there. So that seems to me powerful evidence that the way you're aware of your mental states just is what it's like for you to be in those mental states. And of course, dental fear would make the same case. In the cases of dental fear, you have an anesthetized patient, you have drilling, and the patient reporting that they're in pain. The doctor explains the nerves are anesthetized. The doctor tells them, ah, oh, it's just vibrations, and because you're expecting pain, 
because you're uh, aware of that as a painful experience, you interpret it as pain, but it's not. And the subjects go, oh, okay. And most of the times that works. So again, the way your experiences appear to you seems to be what it's like for you. So this is supposed to be some kind of evidence for the appearances view of phenomenal consciousness. Now, the typical response is there could be top-down effects. And I've heard this from Bloch. I've heard this from Hawk one himself. I think this is their main response. If you expect pain, there is some evidence which shows that that can itself produce a pain state. So maybe there's a ne they're anesthetized, but that doesn't show that the pain states, the first order states, aren't getting generated in this other way. And for dental fear, that sounds like a convincing case, but we still have the oakiness issue to contend because it's not as though you're expecting oakiness. You don't know what oakiness tastes like. You simply apply the concept, your experience changes. Now, I think at the very least, a paper has to be written on this topic. Someone should really focus on this argument um, because it's been made in passing, but it's never really been made the center of attention taking experimental evidence into account. So I would just point that this is a place to do some further research. And then I'll turn to the work that I've been involved with, Hakwan, making this empirical argument. And it's based on their... A uh, paper which has recently been published in Nature Neuroscience. Doby Ranev is the first author. He recently graduated. Congratulations to Doby. Um, and so uh, what we're going to try to show is that what we have is experimental evidence that you get changes in phenomenology without any change in first order representations, no change in activity of the first at the first order level, and with a change at the higher order level, in particular one particular area of the brain. So let's go ahead and look at this experimental evidence. So just to familiarize you with the task, so this diagonal arrow is indicating time. You have subjects, they fixate on the red dot, there's a gray screen, and uh, then they get a stimulus, which is called the pre q stimulus, which are these two arrows pointing along the diagonal. And it will either point along the left-right diagonal or the right-left diagonal. In this case, it's pointing on the left-right. After that cue, you show them the stimuli. And in this case, what they have are these patches. So you either have noise on the one hand, the top left you see noise, or you have a grading pattern. The top right you see a grading pattern. And those are presented along the diagonals. So they're always asked about these diagonals. So after you show them that for 367 milliseconds, then you take it away and you put these little circles there where are supposed to indicate in those areas, did you see noise or grading? So that's their task, noise or grading. And you can either probe them in the area where where they were cued to, as is being showed here, or you could probe them in the area where they were not cued to. Ask them, signal or noise? Grading or noise pattern? So you get the data from that, and you, just a little bit more about the details of this, so about 50% of the time they get gradings, and they can't really, uh, they can't um, uh, predict whether there's gonna be a grading or not, because it's random. 50%. And you tell them the pre-Q indicator is valid 70% of the times, which means that it's a good strategy to attend to where the Q is indicating because you know ahead of time that it's reliable. 70% is, is good, is enough time to pay attention to it. And you give them feedback in blocks. Okay, so you're training them and you're, they're getting, so they're getting better at this. So you collect the behavioral data, and this is basically, um, uh, you get the number of times when they're right, that's a hit, and you get the number of times when they say there's something there and there's, they're wrong, that's a false alarm. And you can calculate these two quantities based on that data, and these are standard uh, psychological measurements. So one is called D prime, which is basically a success rate, it's hits divided by false alarms. Um, it tells you how reliable they are at detecting whether there's a grading or noise there. Now you can also compute 
This other measure, which is known as C, and that's for the criterion. And C is uh, uh, something that you do to the D prime score. So it's just a, a mathematical thing, and the details don't matter. But what it does is it gives you an indication of how the subjects are responding to this task. So if the criterion is conservative, then what that means is that they need a lot of evidence to respond that they saw something. They're not just saying yes all the time. That They need a lot of evidence that they actually did see the thing there before they'll say that they saw it there. Whereas if their criterion is very liberal, they're saying yes all the time. right? They don't need any evidence. So yes, I saw it. I'm, you know, whatever. Yes, yes, yes. Now what's interesting is that you can find conditions where the subjects are equally good. So here on the left you see the dark gray is where they're probing them to the cued area and the light gray is where they're probing the uncued area. And on the left you see their D prime score and what is shown is one that statistically there's no difference. So they're getting the same number right, right? Or getting the same number wrong. They're successful the same amount of time. But in the cued area, so when they're presumably attending to the position you're pointing them towards, they're employing a very conservative criterion. They need a lot of evidence to say they saw something there, to hit that button. Whereas in the uncued area, they seem to be very liberal. They're saying they saw something. They're saying, yes, I see the target. I see it. I see it. It's the thing. So that's very interesting because it looks like the place that they're attending to is not enjoying as much phenomenal consciousness as where they're unattending to. Now, you might say, well, it's just a cognitive bias, right? This is just some judgment thing. It's not a reflecting their actual experience. So they try to control for that by doing a bunch of different conditions. Maybe they just don't care enough, so let's pay them. Well, you pay them and they get the same results. Well, maybe even though they're highly motivated, they're just not good at it. Well, when you pay them and give them detailed strategy tips, you get the same results. Well, maybe it's something to do with how long the stimulus is occurring. Um, it's a memory thing. Well, you adjust that, same results. Maybe they're not really attending where you think they are. Maybe their eyes are roaming around. They're attending all over the place. Well, you track their eye movements, same results. So if this were merely a cognitive thing, should be trained away, but you can't train it away. So it looks like a perceptual thing. Now, importantly, to follow up on this, they did a, a separate study, a separate task, very similar to the first one, but they wanted to say, well, so subjects seem to be um, a saying they see the stimulus more often in the unattended location. Let's ask them about their visibility judgments. So here's a similar study. You're looking at the gray screen. You have the diagonal flasher. But now instead of noise or signal, what they're doing is they're putting gratings there. And they're simply asking participants left tilted or right tilted. And then you can ask them again along the uh, probed area or the, um, excuse me, along the cued area or the uncued diagonal. Okay, so here's what you get. Dark gray, you're probing the cued. Light gray, uncued. You can find the conditions where they're performing equally well, they're equally successful. But now look at the visibility ratings on the right hand side. In the queued, they're saying they're giving much lower visibility ratings. In the uncued area, where they're not paying attention, they're saying it's highly visible. So you put these two together, and here's what you have subjects saying they're saying, I see the target more often. I say, yes, I see it. And also, they're giving a higher visibility rating for it. So what reason don't we have to trust them when they're saying, I see it and it's highly visible? Doesn't that mean that they see it and then it's highly visible? There's no reason to expect otherwise. It seems like phenomenologically, they're having these robust experiences, but their D primes are matched. So the amount of information in the channel is the same in both cases. What that looks like is that the first order representations remain the same But yet, conscious experience is different. Okay, well maybe they're not really attending. Maybe they're just oriented. Maybe they're moving their eyes, um, and et cetera, and et cetera.
So they did a follow-up study, and this isn't in the Nature Neuroscience, this is one that's in review, and so here's some data, I'll just go through it quickly. Um, the task is a bit more complicated, and they actually gave them a very hard task. So first of all, they put them in the scanner, they find out where their attention activity is, um, and we don't need to worry about that. But so here's the task. You show them, there's looking at the screen, there's these dots. They look at it for 20 to 40 seconds. Then they get 100 milliseconds of motion. And the dots either all move outwards, expanding, or they all move inwards, contracting in some unified, coherent way. But only for 100 milliseconds. And then 400 milliseconds of random motion. So they see it, then random. Then you ask them um, uh, uh, to just look at the screen, right? You're not asking them to direct their attention. You're not asking them um, to push a button or anything like that. You're at, and you're asking for visibility ratings and so forth. Okay, so very difficult task. Very difficult task. Now, what do they find? So here's... On the left, the amount of change in the signal. In the dark bars, um, we have instances where they're right. In the light bar, instances where they're wrong. And then also on the bottom, we've grouped it as according to, according to low confidence or high confidence. So what does this graph tell us? Well, it shows us that when subjects are reporting low confidence, right, when they're saying, oh, I don't know if it was moving outward or moving inward, I have no idea um, whether I was right or wrong, there uh, is more activity in the attentional areas. So these are negative numbers on the left, so these smaller bars represent more activity. So when they're highly confident that they got it right, there's less activity. So given that high activity means attending, low activity means not attending as much, they are highly confident when they aren't attending. And again, they're not asked to attend anywhere. They're just tracking spontaneous fluctuation. So whenever there's high activity, they're giving low confidence, whether they're getting it right or wrong. So all of these taken together seem very strongly to suggest that Attending produces this richer phenomenology in the unattended to areas. Now, Bo, we can look back and use this as an argument against block, right? Representations in V4 don't seem to be conscious. There's just as much activity in those areas as there is in the other cases, but in one case it's highly visible, in the other case they're saying it's not highly visible at all. And there's no difference in those first order activity areas. Um, but why think it's, you know, higher order activity? Maybe it's something else. Well, just really quickly, to remind us what's important here, we'll look at the Lau and Passingham results from 2006. So here, similar task, this one involves masking. You're just looking at a blank screen. You're shown either a diamond or a square, and then that thing is masked. So they put something which covers it up, and so if you vary the stimulus in the right way, subjects will say they don't see it at all. And then you're asking them, diamond or square? And so here's the famous results. You can see this line here. You find two cases. Um, it's the same kind of stuff we looked at before, but you find two cases where the D prime is matched and the visibility um, ratings are different. In one case, they're saying they just guessed. They didn't see it at all. In the other case, they're saying, yeah, of course I saw it. It was right there. It was a diamond. In the other case, they're saying, look, I don't know if it's a diamond or square. Diamond, maybe? Okay, but they're equally right in those two cases. Now, that's just what we've seen so far. But what they did for the 2006 study is they used fMRI. And when they put these subjects in the scanner, the only difference that showed up was a difference in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So if you put all of these results together, you have subjects saying, yes, I see it. It's highly visible. There's no change in the amount of information in the system. There's no change in the fMRI activity of these first order areas. The only change you find between the two conditions is in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex it looks, therefore, like 
horror theory is empirically supported and that we might tentatively identify these representations as being in the prefrontal cortex. Okay, so there's a lot more that could be said about this, but um, we're getting short on time. So let me turn to the last part of the talk, which is the 2D argument against non-materialism, uh, doing some of the a priori work. So what's the argument against non-materialism? Well, let's define a shambi as a duplicate of me with no non-physical properties, but with consciousness. Now, shambis are conceivable. If they're conceivable, they're possible. So non-materialism is false. And what I like to think is that the entire first part of the talk, or everything we've just been talking about, is an argument for the first premise of this 2D argument. What we've seen is that shambis are conceivable. It really is conceivable that phenomenal consciousness just be a higher order representation. We've looked at philosophical arguments which point in that direction. We've looked at empirical arguments which point in that direction. So whether it's true or not, it certainly seems possible. And it seems like what we've done um, is to show that non-materialism is false. Now, I'm not the only one who's made this kind of argument. So uh, Keith Frankish has also argued for what he calls anti-zombies, and Keith and I had a discussion about this on Philosophy TV. Here's a, a still frame from that discussion. So I like zombies, he likes anti-zombies, and you might think, well, look, we're talking about the same thing here. Um, actually, I don't know if we are talking about the same thing, and that's why I continue to use the word zombie as opposed to anti-zombie. So Keith denies that there's any neutral conception of consciousness. What he says is our conceptions of consciousness are loaded. You either pack into it something which is non-physical or something which is not non-physical, something physical. But there's no way to start neutrally. Well, now, if that's the case, then what is he imagining or conceiving of when he conceives of an anti-zombie? Is he using his concept of consciousness? Well, if his concept of consciousness is simply a physical one, then it's question-begging. He's just saying, I can conceive that physicalism is true. But that's not what the zombie argument does. The zombie argument is not something that says, I can conceive that dualism is true, therefore it is. Now, on the other hand, is he using the dualist conception of consciousness? Well, of course, if it builds into it that it's non-physical, then it can't be conceived to be physical. That's a contradiction. So it looks like if you really take Keith's view seriously, there's a problem. Now, on my view, you start with something neutral, and that's what we did. A con a phenomenal contrast, simply the idea of there being something that it's like for you. It's that there's nothing, it's not just all in the dark, it's... Um, et cetera, et cetera, right? You, you start off with that neutral conception. Then you flesh it out. It could be a higher order. It could be a first order. You look at evidence. You arrive at the conclusion, higher order, better supported. That could be physical. And no place along the way did we start off with a loaded dice. So I think that the Shambi argument is stronger because it starts with this neutral conception of consciousness. Okay, now I think what we've done then is to give a two-dimensional analysis of consciousness. So um, there's two intentions. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details. I assume most people know them. So on these kinds of uh, identity statements, the primary intentions are contingent. So what is the primary intention of consciousness? Well, one way of reading the higher order view is as claiming that the primary intention of conscious, phenomenal consciousness, is the transitivity principle. A conscious mental state is one I am conscious of myself as being in. Well, if that's true, then we know that phenomenally conscious states just are states of my being aware of myself as being in some first order state. That gives us a way to pick out phenomenal consciousness across possible worlds. And in some worlds, it'll pick out something physical, in other words, it won't. But that's very different than a secondary intention, which is whatever it is that it picks out at that world. I mean, that's oversimplifying it, but it's whatever thing it turns out to be. And we've seen likely 
here, that's a brain state. So that's too necessary, which means that, you know, no world's considered as counter counterfactual are going to have the brain state but no consciousness. And there's not going to be any worlds where there is consciousness but no brain states considered counterfactually. But of course, if we consider those words as actual, we can find worlds where there's consciousness of a different variety, where the primary intention is false. But notice what's important about this response is that one of those worlds is not the zombie world. Oftentimes people say, look, when the primary intention of this statement is false, what they mean is, oh, I'm conceiving of a zombie world. But of course you can't do that because the two intention is necessary. So the zombie world turns out to be inconceivable on this 2D analysis. When we conceive of a world where the primary intention of consciousness is false, what we mean is that the kind of awareness that just is consciousness isn't a brain state. Not that there are brain states without that. Okay, now if you don't like this view, I would just like to point out something which I think is often overlooked in these cases. A primary intention is just a function. It takes possible worlds and gives you a truth value. Just a function from tr possible worlds of truth values. So thinking about names has already shown us that uh, it might not be the case that every primary intention is a description. So maybe consciousness is like that too. If so, you can still conceive of that thing being physical um, if you don't have to, exp even if you don't like this explicitly sort of transitivity way of doing it. And I'll maybe leave that open for discussion after we're done. So then, finally, what do we say about Kripke? Well, on the Kripke version of this, what we've discovered is that there can be fool's pain. So a pain without a brain state is impossible. What is possible is someone who is in the same epistemic position as me. When I feel pain, but who is not in pain. So typically, people think of the dental fear case as being ones of these kinds of cases. Um, this person's in the same epistemic position as I am <clears throat> when I'm in pain, but they're not in pain. They don't have the first order of pain state. But even further, when Kripke says, look, I can imagine the pain without the brain state, he can't really imagine that. That's fool's pain. This person is not in pain because pains are identical to brain states. And really, overgeneralizing here, this Kripkean version of it is just taking the two intention part seriously and ignoring the one intention part. And in a way, that's a roughly a way of making sense of what Kripke's argument is doing. Of course, there's devils in the details and etc. Okay, so that is me trying to do too much covering every topic of interest to me with respect to phenomenal consciousness. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.